Welcome to The Rich Report, a podcast with news and information on high-performance computing. Today, my guest is Ronald Luchin from the uh, IBM Research Lab in Zurich, and uh, we'll join this podcast in progress. Okay, so this is about the, uh, the Dome 64-bit uh, micro data center. And uh, I always like to say the real title should be Computers Free and Data is Not. I think most people don't realize that we have entered the era where, uh, I don't want to say uh, this in a denigrating way, but the reality is that people in Taiwan now can build high performance, low cost, uh, very efficient and very reliable servers. And I think uh, the uh, older economy is trying to get uh, grips on how to build new business models on the top of this paradigm of free compute. I mean, one of the examples is like uh, things like a banana pie or the Raspberry Pi 3, where you get 64-bit computing, uh, where you can put a full, uh, true Linux on there with memory management, and the whole thing is like uh, $30, right? So um, certainly IBM is not going to make uh, money on uh, making hardware in that realm, which is why IBM uh, got out of this uh, x86 uh, server business. Um, but the question is, how do we, uh, in, the, in the planet, build new value systems on, on top of that? So the Dome project was started between IBM and uh, Astron, the Institute for Radio Astronomy in the Netherlands, when Astron finished LOFAR, which is considered to be a 1% demonstrator for the SKA, the Square Kilometer Array, they came to IBM saying, SKA is uh, the next thing for us to work on, but uh, it is not like SKA is 100 times more difficult than LOFAR, because it doesn't scale linearly, it scales at least quadratically, so we're looking at 10,000 times more complex. So how do we, uh, Astron, do this? The world in, in radio astronomy is looking at Astron to help solve this, and we have no idea how to do this. IBM, please help us. Now, IBM had uh, a long time ago uh, been able to place a blue gene at uh, LOFAR to do the, the processing, so there was a good relationship between IBM and Astron. And then we started a project called DOME. Now, I've been at IBM for 32 years now, and I was sick and tired of acronyms, so DOME is not an acronym. DOME signifies the uh, radio astronomy aspect by having the name of the building around an optical telescope, which is a DOME. But DOME is also the name of the tallest mountain that is entirely within the Swiss borders, um, which is not known to the outside, but you have to understand the, the Mont Blanc we share with other people and the Matterhorn we share with Italy. So the tallest mountain, which is 4,545 meters, is called Dome. And so the logo projects the mountain dome onto a dome. So what are we solving here? SKA is comparable to what happens in CERN. In fact, SKA and CERN are looking for the same answer. The difference in CERN is that they create mini Big Bangs by shooting protons at near light speed on each other and the radio astronomer says, nah, we don't like simulation, let's look at the real Big Bang. Now the real Big Bang happened 13.8 billion years ago, so how do you look at that? Well, answer, you build a antenna and you point at 13.8 billion light years into space and then you catch the radio waves that were generated at the time. Now, this requires an antenna that's a little bit better than what you have in your cell phone, hence square kilometer array. It is a distributed antenna that has a total collecting area of around a square kilometer or uh, you know, 1000 by 1000 meters so a million square meters. So if you were to use your typical satellite dishes, uh, your TV satellite dishes to uh, create that antenna, you would need about three million dishes. Okay, so that's a lot. Then, uh, this is a distributed antenna, so they call this uh, in this speak uh, an interferometer, so VLBI, very large baseline interferometry, and this one end of the machine is up to 3,000 miles away from the other end of the machine. 
And they have to build this in the desert because they don't want to have radio pollution. So no people with cell phones, no airplanes, no TV, no radio. And the desert has two really interesting features. There is no power grid, there is no networking. And the data that is generated at the end of the antenna uh, heads, the raw data, is 14, point, uh, 14 exabytes per day. And the 14 exabytes per day go through this uh, processing pipeline. I won't go into details, but, but currently this is just nothing but uh, a large FFT. And at the end there is one petabyte per day that they want to keep. Now, the challenge is the amount of processing that has to be done, which of course, if you have so much data, you cannot do at the centralized location, so you have to process where the data is being generated. And the amount of operations that is needed is, uh, when the machine comes alive in 2024, is a hundred times more operations per second than the exascale machine that we expect at around the same time. I think we'll have one exascale machine at that time and I don't think that the SKA guys are going to be the ones to use that machine. So they have to find their own solution. And um, the picture that you see here is of course the well-known uh, extrapolation of the top 500. And what you see is that we have a hundred times more operations per second than the exascale machine. So how are we going to solve that? Because depending on how you measure uh, we need an improvement of a factor of between 100 and 1000. And this basically says we need multiple breakthroughs. Now you know that if you can uh, show a venture capitalist that you get uh, 10 times more performance with a new technology compared to uh, state of the art, they're ready to send you money. So this is the equivalent of three startups in series to help solve that problem. And Dome started to uh, try to uh, enforce this, um, this innovation. Uh, to make run remark, of course, we don't need floating point operations, so this is operations per second, and at the beginning of the antenna we can do this with a couple of integer bits of processing, but down the line, somewhere, it actually does become floating point, although I think with 32-bit floating point uh, we would be fine. But still, uh, we need multiple breakthroughs. So within Dome, we started seven projects. So we met, uh, I think it was late 2011, uh, with Marco de Vos, the managing director of uh, Astrom. And we discussed in the order of 23 different projects, and seven were selected, where we said, we do technology roadmap development, so not direct implementation uh, development that for sure goes in SKA. No, we do technology roadmap development that would then enable uh, development for the real hardware that would then be selected by SKA and or Astron. And the seven projects that were selected were a holistic modeling um, tooling capability that we call algorithms and machines for lack of a better name. And then we had and that was a, an overarching uh, activity. And then we had a computing, a transport, and a storage track. Computing, we focus on microservers. So when we started this, I actually called this uh, my microserver project. I now call this micro data center because we have actually evolved to uh, having an entire data center in a very small form factor. And the word microserver has a negative connotation uh, as some companies will want you to believe that microservers implies shitty performance and you never want to buy something like this. The other track is accelerators and then in transport we have nanophotonics. Um, I'd like to mention that we currently have a demonstrator implementation in the desert in Australia where we take the data feed from the antenna with photonics to the um, data processing point, but these um, fibers actually transport the analog radio wave. And the reason is we don't want to do sampling at the antenna head because the sampling generates lots of EMI, lots of noise that you don't want to uh, feed back into the antenna where you're trying to actually see something else. 
And so we just amplify the optical signal, we send that through the fiber, and then it is sampled uh, very far away from where the data is being collected to the antenna with an obvious advantage. Then we have an activity in real-time communications and new algorithms. I'll, I'll highlight this a little bit later when I do the demo. Storage, obviously, when we generate a petabyte of data and we have scientists around the world who want to explore this data, uh, we have an issue on A, how can we cost-effectively store all of this data and how do we find our way in the data uh, for all of this, uh, this work. Now we started this in uh, 2012 um, the total investment made between uh, the public-private partnership between IBM, Astron and the Dutch government is around 33 million euro in five years and um, we are now at the end of, of the, the DOME project and uh, I can show you the results. So here I'll I'll go and zoom into the micro data center project. So I like to start with definition, so uh, to, to really make it clear what we're talking about. So a micro data center, in my view, is the integration of compute storage networking, power and cooling into an ultra compact form factor that gives you a self-contained data center using microserver technology and this is about 64-bit server-class computing, so we have ECC on the DRAMs and the caches, so this is not a Raspberry Pi type of computing, right? This is, uh, the micro data center is not done for hobbyists. But somebody actually did say, ah, so this is like a Raspberry Pi for professional use. I said, that's an interesting way you can put this. Yes, this is a, a server-class machine with the uh, reliability, so the, the RAS characteristics that you want for data centers. Now I also like to use only standards, so we use Ethernet networking, we have storage, hot water cooling uh, is a necessary ingredient to get to this density. Uh, if somebody insists on using air cooling for whatever reason, you give up at least a factor of 4 on density. And we deliver high performance. Um, not the highest single thread performance, right? But that's for a very small niche of the market and we're not after that. We're for best of breed energy efficiency at competitive cost and as I mentioned, I like to use commodity and standards only. So I see this as an appliance. And here you see the light bulb as the example of the most uh, inexpensive uh, appliance. So this actually allows deployment in space constrained locations. So when we started this project, we never imagined that we would at the same time get this uh, uh, whole trend of IoT, Internet of Technology, where people start to realize that we have to move the compute to the data. But it's kind of hard to move a data center to where your sensors get all the data from, for instance, a big city together. So now we have the technology that can put the data center in one of those gray boxes that you see on the curb. Uh, and cooling is easy because water pipes for the water distribution is usually around and we can use that to cool the whole system. So it actually fits. Now, when I say best of breed energy efficiency and competitive cost, we need to look at the technology trends. So what are they? Um, here I see uh, a chart that shows Moore's Law. Uh, everybody knows this chart in this business. But what I'd like to highlight, and this is a publication that was done uh, by The Economist in their technology quarterly of uh, about a year ago, March 2016, and I highlight this inset. So I take the same picture, but I just put a red box around what you get with the, the transistor cost per, uh, uh, per new technology. So what we see is that the, uh, the number of transistors that you get per dollar is slowly going down. So that's an interesting design point. And what are some of the other trends? So this is data that I computed based on publications from Intel. Numbers that I show here are basically taking the numbers from Intel and presenting them with a calculation in a different form. And this is some of the things that underline my statement about computers free and data is not. 
So one of the things that I did a long time ago was in this lab in 1987 I built together with uh, colleagues the first switch chip, the first packet switch chip in 1987. And at that time we had a technology at our disposal where on a large die, like 1.2 centimeters on each side, we got 2000 gates. And we had about 500 pins. So the cost of a gate was amazing. And pins were relatively to gates free. We squandered pins. We never worried about bandwidth over pins. We worried about gates. Today the world is reverse. You get billions of gates on a piece of silicon, but we still only have in the order of today 2000 pins. So the cost of a pin has gone up tremendously, but the cost of a gate is basically zero. And then we look at another trend, which is where does the energy go? So in 1987 the energy went into the gates and none went into I.O. Today the reverse is true. Today the energy goes in communication and much less in compute. So I make a distinguish between the local wiring on a chip and the global wiring on a chip. And the local wiring I consider to be part of the function. So if you look at an FPU I say the local wiring around those transistors make up the function of your floating point unit and that I consider to be compute energy. So even the energy used in the local wiring I say is compute energy. And the global wiring is what connects the FPU to the buses, uh, what connects the core to the caches and what connects the cache to the next level cache and the on-chip bus etc. And what you see is this chart here which is published by, by Shrekar Borkar who uh, is a really fantastic guy from Intel and what they do is they just publish this number relative 1 you see that the uh, compute energy goes down much faster and the uh, on-die global interconnect energy goes down much less fast but uh, when you take that data and you compare this to other points uh, that are published you can actually make this uh, calculation where I say this chart uh, shows the global wiring energy versus compute energy versus compute nodes and what you see is that uh, somewhere between uh, 45 and 32 nanometer and these are all based on, on Intel data so that's compute uh, chips so Xeon typically you see that the compute energy versus communication energy is on par somewhere between 45 and 32 nanometer and at 40 nanometer you see that on chip we use twice the energy for communication versus computing and this is a, uh, a point of inclination that I don't think people are realizing enough who, who build systems right and I actually postulate that somewhere around uh, 2012 we have entered the third phase of scaling so you know that until 2000 around 2002 2005 depending on how you want to look at this we say we have the denar scaling so constant energy density then we went to, to non denar scaling and I now say we have entered the phase of communication energy dominated scaling and this has fundamental uh, implications so based on looking at the technology what did we just learn so we see transistors actually become more expensive communication energy starts to dominate things and this chart here uh, which looks like you know uh, a shot from Star Wars that reminds me to tell you about well how do we now rethink our system so what do we know we want to build a very energy efficient system. Two thirds of the energy on chip goes to communication. I also spent uh, a fair amount of time with uh, colleagues in the photonic world. I actually uh, co organize um, uh, photonic system design conferences together with um, Lionel Kimmerling, known as Kim from MIT to understand how photonics can be applied and let me short circuit the insight um, you will use photonics only when you currently exceed the figure of merit which is a hundred gigabit per second meter that means if you have to build a link with a single lane speed of 100 gigabits per second 
you will use photonics when you exceed the distance of one meter, a hundred gigabit per second meter. Or if you want to communicate a hundred meters, you do this when you exceed a gigabit. That's a hundred gigabit per second meter. Anything below that, for economic reasons, you will stay electronic. And it's very simple. All data is sank and sourced in CMOS. So whatever you do, it it goes from silicon and it ends in silicon. And um, to go photonic, you pay an adder to transfer from the photonic to the electrical domain and back. And this adder costs a lot of energy and is expensive. Therefore, if you want to go photonic for long distance when you exceed this metric, um, the best is to to convert immediately to where the data is generated. So I think that in the long future we will have direct photonic links on our CPUs or on at least on the package of our CPUs because that is the best way to go from an energy viewpoint. But most of the links are short and they will remain on circuit board or on carriers and they will remain electrical. Now we go back to physics. Maxwell teaches us in his equations that the energy used in the wire is proportional to the distance and the communication speed. Communication speed has to go up because we have to increase our performance. The energy consumption has to go down because we want to have more energy efficient systems. So I have only one parameter to play with. I have to shrink the distance. The insight that I say here is old. It is very old. Seymour Cray, when he built his very first Cray, did exactly the same thing. He built this round machine and um, he did that to shorten the distances. He was fighting exactly the same problem. In fact, there was a supercomputing conference a few years ago where they handed out the DVD of the original keynote that Seymour Cray gave at the very first supercomputing conference. I encourage everybody to watch it because that video no matter how old it is today, describes today's problems. It is really amazing. We haven't really changed much. We have just a lot more technology, uh, but we have exactly the same issues. So, I come to the second definition. A microserver is the integration of an entire server node motherboard into a single microchip, except the DRAM, Norboot Flash and power conversion logic. The latter is for very pragmatic reasons only. It's a very bad idea to put a memory technology on a fast logic processor. A memory has to be slow because you want a low refresh rate. And to put DRAM directly onto a, uh, a fast logic process is fundamentally the wrong approach. So same for flash. And power conversion logic needs high voltages. You want to convert something from like 12 volt to like 1 volt or less than 1 volt for your uh, cores. Um, but 12 volts cannot be dealt with in a high speed logic process. The things would break. So that's why I say microservers exclude those type of functions. So we don't put them on the same microchip. But everything else that we have on a circuit board, and this picture shows a typical uh, you know, 30 by 25 centimeter circuit board with connectors and, and boatloads of chips, and we convert that into a board which is uh, 14 centimeters by 6 centimeters, where we have a microchip that contains all the functions that you need for a server. This means it doesn't only have the compute, it also has the storage and the networking interface on the same SOC. I like to call that a server on a chip. Some people like SOC to be system on a chip, I call it a server on a chip. And uh, we have actually shown that you can do this. There are people who would like you to believe that this implies shitty performance. Yes. There are many chips out there that will give you bad performance, but if you take the right SOC, you actually get really decent performance. Now, if you want to build a micro data center, you do need more than just compute. So we have done the same game to an entire top of rack switch. So we have integrated the entire top of rack switch, which is a, a huge and loud box, by the way into a absolutely quiet, what we call a micro switch. Not to be confused with the mechanical micro switches where you see whether a door is open. 
and we integrate here a 64 port 10 gigabit ethernet switch in the same form factor as our micro server except that this is thicker uh, be also because also the board uh, consumes a lot more power than the um, microservers. The original form factor of our microserver board was inspired on the memory DIMM. And so here you see a picture of the memory DIMM. And uh, the very first prototype we built actually used also the same DIMM connector because it's inexpensive. Uh, but the chip that we have was already larger than the height of this board, so we needed to make the height larger, which we did. And we then changed the connector to go from the DIMM to a 3M SPD connector, which is capable to get uh, 10 gigabit Ethernet signals directly over the connector, which a DIMM connector cannot do. And um, on that, we then put our cooling solution. And so the bottom picture shows the cooling plate, which is over the circuit board. And what we do is we delid this uh, SOC after it has been soldered on the board to expose the chip directly. And then we put on our own copper plate, so the, our own heat spreader, that extends on the left and right side beside the uh, circuit board that is then electrically and thermally contacted to actually provide the energy uh, with uh, 12 volt that is distributed through these rivets over the board and then uh, retrieve the, uh, the heat uh, at the other end. And what we get is then this system <coughs> where you see the aluminum cooling rails which is where the water circulates. So our system is what we call indirect hot water cooling so the, the water doesn't get all the way to the chips which is uh, up to a certain amount of uh, heat generated per blade is the cheapest way to go because we have to deal a lot less with uh, connectors or bayonet uh, couplings uh, to the servers right because we now have this only for a 32 way board so this picture shows uh, just your regular uh, 12 volt power supply and then the cooling rails the power supply uh, connects directly to the, the cooling rails and uh, the hot water cooling loop also connects to the, uh, the cooling rails and when you look at the system from the top then you see here the cooling rails again uh, in this case you see that we have installed eight server nodes uh, right now as we are just building up the system I don't have enough uh, server blades manufactured to fully populate and also the rails only go halfway uh, we currently are finishing the rails that will go full way and we have a second batch of uh, microservers on order to uh, fully populate the system so we can do the, the full validation of, of that system. What we also have is a power node. Uh, this is uh, providing all the power supplies to 16 servers that you need for DRAM, I.O. Uh, we have um, the challenge that a server needs many many different voltages. So the copper plate only carries the energy for the high wattage domain. Uh, so only for the onboard one volt converter. Uh, the other voltages are common and that saves also cost again, right? So we make uh, IO and DRAM power for 16 nodes in at one go. Then we have a, a management slot here. Our system is full IPMI version two managed. So it just looks like a regular rack in a data center. Uh, from a management viewpoint and we also have integrated storage so each server gets its private up to one gigabyte drive in form of uh, an SSD or uh, an MSATA packaging standard so we now have a data center in a box with um, compute <coughs> with storage and with uh, communication uh, we go to the outside in this prototype with uh, QSFP cages, so plug in whatever connectivity you would like, but it is Ethernet. This diagram shows the circuit board of um, our microserver. So we currently have uh, two boards. The, the diagram of this board shows the PowerPC64 based T4240 from NXP. And what you see is that this board 
this diagram looks deceptively simple. Now, in my many years of, uh, of working in this business, I found it is easy to build a complex system, but it is complex to build an easy system. And only easy systems scale. If you start with something complex, it doesn't scale. So, we spent a long time to make this as simple as possible. In fact, Einstein says, make things as simple as possible, but just not simpler. And out of the T4040 you get 4 times 10 gigabit Ethernet, PCI Express by 8, 2 times SATA. So this gives me everything that I need to build a server. Then we have three memory channels, uh, all with ECC. This is DDR3 in this case, with a uh, acceptable performance. And then we have our 1 volt power converter that takes a 12 volt from the cooling plate. We have a flash that is external, so we can boot this system. And then we have something where my colleague Andreas During has done phenomenal work to integrate all of what we call the glue logic that you find on a typical server board. Because these chips, they don't boot themselves uh, easily. You need a lot of stuff to get this working. So this PSOC is interfaced through USB. I said we want to use standards but the most inexpensive version. So our management runs over USB. It is the most inexpensive way you can build systems. And the PSOC, which is uh, a trademark by Cypress, does the uh, on and off power sequencing of all of the voltage domains. It monitors the power supply, voltages and current. It provides the boot configuration over I2C to the SOC. It has the JTAG and hardware counter performance access capability to the SOC. So if you run um, a high performance application, you want to see uh, where the resources are being consumed on the SOC. We can do this without disrupting anything uh, in the Linux uh, system because we have an independent uh, port into these uh, SOCs to do that. And then of course Linux, when you boot this, it likes to say hi on the good old uh, serial port, or UART, which we then connect over the PSOC to USB, and we can see that uh, on our management console. And it does the temperature management and protection. So we, since we're building a very dense hot water cooled system, we want to make sure that in case something goes wrong, that we can immediately turn off the system before the smoke comes out. And then of course we have the complete management interface and control, uh, so we can do version management, we can assign MAC addresses, uh, etc. All of this is in uh, firmware that is in this, uh, in this PSOC, which at the end is fully IPMI managed. We offer two boards at this point. The T4240 based is uh, fully validated, the 64-bit ARM which is an 8-core A72 board, is almost ready. Uh, I think the hardware is okay. We validated the memory channels. Um, the SOC seems to be running. I just need a little bit more time now to uh, adapt U-Boot, uh, uh, which is the bias for the embedded world, if you will. So the T4240, we have uh, 24 cores at 1.8 gigahertz power PC, three memory channels totaling uh, 24 gigabyte. And uh, this is using what uh, is known as the E6500 core by NXP. The ARM board is using the uh, newest A72 core. I think this is a really exciting part. I think it uses a little bit less uh, energy, but that remains to be seen. It runs at at least 2.0 GHz. I expect it can run faster. It is DDR4, so we get better memory performance and lower uh, consumption and it fits in the same slot on our carrier. So we offer a choice of ISAs. Um, in fact, I'm looking for the funding to build a Xeon D board. Uh, a Xeon D will fit in this form factor and it only has a two gigabit, uh, two 10 gigabit interfaces, but that's enough to, uh, to build a system. Um, I think uh, that gives people uh, the choice to figure out what ISA they want. We're not telling them what they should use. 
Now we also have an activity to uh, in the same slot to put an FPGA board. You can pair them with a CPU and connect them through PCI, or you can fully populate a 32-way carrier with the FPGA that then is connected with 4 times 10 gigabit E. So we can do acceleration of whatever kind is most appropriate to an FPGA. I'm also looking for funding to build a GPU board. Uh, we're looking at this, it's not yet uh, completely done. Then, um, the 32-way carrier can then house, uh, based on what we currently have, either 32-PowerPC uh, or 32-bit ARM, or 16-PowerPC, 16 16-ARM. 16 Since the DDR4 requires different voltages from DDR3, uh, given that we have common DDR, Voltage generation, we can only have the, the same DDR voltages in 16 slots. That's why we uh, require either 16 uh, PowerPC or 16 uh, ARM uh, for one section of the board. We have uh, our 64 bit, 64 port uh, 10 gigabit Ethernet switch in the middle. So I now call a TOR, top of rack, now middle of chassis, MOC. And we expect that a 32-way carrier like this would get you about one teraflop of uh, sustained Linpack performance using the T424. And this is not an HPC machine, number one, right? So this is not something that you would choose to build your next net HPC node. Although the T4240 board is, from a performance viewpoint, quite comparable to the Blue Gene Q node. But it is made with commodity and standards. Um, so if you put two carriers into a 2U rack unit, which is what uh, we are trying to get into market later this year, then you get 64 compute nodes with a total of 1500 cores, 1 1.5 terabytes of DRAM, uh, 16 times 40 gigabit Ethernet at the end with full bisectional bandwidth and 64 terabyte of storage of maximum in that system, which I think is a really interesting uh, offering. And the total power consumption we expect is around 3 kilowatts per rack unit in that, in that case. A little bit about uh, the structure. So if I put the switch in this diagram on the top, although it's in the middle on our carrier, then we connect each uh, switch, sorry, each uh, compute node uh, with a 10 gigabit Ethernet link directly to the switch that then gets out with full bisectional bandwidth but in forms of 80 times 40 g So this gives uh, the guys at the data center the option to figure out the final topology. right? So we can make something that has loads of east-west bandwidth, of loads of uh, north-south bandwidth, or whatever combination you like. The yellow nodes are the compute nodes. The greenish ones is the combined power nodes that, that gives a supply for the I.O. voltages as mentioned. And then we have the storage card that gives each compute node its own uh, SATA storage. Customers can basically select what they want. If they say we don't want integrated storage, you leave out this board and you do everything over network. right? You, net, you NFS mount your root file system, that is an option. We also have the management node, so there is a 33rd T4240, which is at the edge of the board, and it's always powered on. So the moment you turn on the system, this node is running, and it runs the IPMI management, and it has the entire management bus to all of the nodes. So each node has a PSOC that is used to manage the node, to power up, power down, monitor, uh, etc. Also the switch is management uh, through this management bus. And the switch is also connected with a PCIe connection to do the configuration. Uh, this is basically a Fulcrum 6000 series from Intel. Um, so it, it can do also a fair amount of level 3 processing if, uh, if somebody would want to enable that. Um, the topology, <coughs> since we have four um, 10 gigabit links from the T4240. The ARM based board, by the way, has six. With six, you can build uh, an interesting 3D hypercube, of course. Uh, our carrier, by the way, is fully passive and doesn't take a lot of money to spin. So, if somebody wants a different topology, uh, we can build a carrier with uh, different ways of setting up the topology. The carrier we just built right now with uh, universal topology. 
Uh, this diagram shows uh, again each node having a 10 gig link to the switch. What are the other three links doing? So we have four nodes that sit in a ring. Uh, so we can build uh, a four-way cluster like this uh, in case the switch wouldn't work. But also each node is connected to a, a green link that passes the, uh, the board where we use a high frequency 3M cable to connect to the other BB2, so the other 32-way carrier that sits in the same rack unit. So this means we can go, if there's a, uh, a failure of this link or uh, uh, this port doesn't work on the switch for some reason, then this node can go to its corresponding node and then through that node go through the switch to the outside world. So we have plenty of redundancy in the, in the topology. Um, now, what did we learn to go a little bit into uh, unexpected discoveries? So, I told you, we said we want to really minimize distances to uh, save energy. And that, of course, was the right thing. Now, I'm not a dumb guy, but only when we were designing the BB2, I started to realize we can actually save a lot of power because we have now such short links that we can run the Ethernet fileless. So we communicate Mac to Mac and so for each switch node and for each server node I have eliminated on the same link a file chip. So on the BB2 alone I have eliminated 160 file chips. They run for like $10 a piece and they consume 5 watts. And so, some people say, your cooling solution must be really expensive. Reality is, our heat spreader is going to be below $10, is, is our expected design point in volume. And that is about the cost of our phi chip. So we eliminate the phi chip, and with this we get our cooling solution. So, guys, this works, right? Um... So this is the, the system that we're currently in, in bring up. Uh, as mentioned, it shows basically uh, the SATA carrier here that we have the root file system for the, uh, the management node that always runs. Then we have a USB hub module. This contains all of the active electronics that is needed to run this uh, passive carrier board. Uh, so it has the USB tree, lots of uh, USB hub module chips are on there. The power node that has the uh, power common to all the uh, servers, the management node as I mentioned, and the storage node, and then this one has eight servers, and the switch node that, uh, that you see here. Um, performance. Everybody asks about performance. Now I admit that this performance is a little bit older. Um, but you have to understand that this entire project, the results that you see, is done with four and a half people here at Zurich Research. So we are definitely in the category of skunk works rather than uh, you know, fully funded uh, large development teams. There's pros and cons to this. Uh, the con is that uh, uh, the small team has to do everything themselves. So currently I don't have time to do a, a new performance comparison. So it's a little bit older, but still I think very interesting. So I compare uh, the Freescale based 12 core, 24 threads, sometimes called 24 core uh, machine in 28 nanometer bulk with a energy optimized Xeon E3 1230LV3, which is a 4 core 8 thread machine in 22 nanometer FinFET. And what I compare here is uh, uh, Specbench, so Cint, um, Freescale, now NXP didn't want me to publish the floating point results, so I cannot publish them. Um, and what we see is that single thread, we are three times slower than the Intel machine, which is not a surprise. Intel spends an awful lot of uh, effort to get very high single thread performance out of their machines. And there is a good reason for this and there's many applications that benefit from this, but there's also a large range of applications where this doesn't make all that much business sense. However, when we now go to C and base all threads, so we now have all threads running, what I see is that I get 40% more performance 
than the Intel chip. And then for the embedded world there's something called CoreMark that uh, in the regular data center world nobody cares about and you see CoreMark we actually get uh, three times more than, uh, than the Intel uh, but that's only for the embedded people. The key thing however is we get 40% more aggregate performance but only at 70% of the node level energy. Node level energy means the entire server node. So in the case of Intel, this includes uh, what they now call their chipset uh, chip. Uh, it used to be called Southbridge. But remember, on the classical server, we have many, many transitions of signals across various chips to go to the outside. Right? So for an Ethernet connection, we have a bunch of connections. Right? We go from uh, our Intel CPU to our support chip, and then we go to our Phi chip. Every time we have a transition, it has to be 50 ohm matched impedance, and we spend boatloads of energy on data. I think I mentioned this before. So the interesting thing is, we get two times more operations per joule. You say, okay, that's interesting. Then I tell you, remind again, we get this with an older technology. I'm running this in 28 nanometer bulk, and at system level, I get better operations per joule. How is this possible? Well, we are at an inclination point in our industry where it says that if you make the smart decisions at system level, and I start at the data center level, not at the server node level, and I work my way down, and I then say this is what my SOC shall deliver. If you do the right decisions, you can be better even if you do not have the latest and greatest most expensive CMOS at your disposal. This hasn't happened in our 40 years of scaling ever. Right? And now we are here. It's another sign of slowdown of CMOS. I call this innovator's dilemma at work. I love Clayton Christensen's work. I think that he gave the best uh, keynote at supercomputing in, I think it's 2012, if I remember correctly. Um, definitely worth watching. So what are the key features? We have two times operations per joule, compared to, I admit, a somewhat older Xeon. Uh, we get 20 times more density with our water cooling. So this technology, with the same delivered aggregate performance, collapses an entire rack, including the, the top of rack switch, into a rack unit. We have no moving parts, we have no fans, we have no rotating hard drives, the only thing that moves is the water. And I introduce a new figure of merit. I call this uh, CPU memory bandwidth density. So I calculate the total bandwidth on our system uh, and divide this by the size of the enclosure. And I get bandwidth per second per liter. And uh, we can package up to 128 of our T4240s into a 2 rack unit. And if we do that, we get 159 gigabytes per second per liter, which is, I think, relevant to big data problems. And the next server, which is from Intel, is a factor of 10 away from this number. So the value of what we deliver is basically density, energy efficiency, commodity components and standards, with a minimal component count. Uh, minimal component count has a good impact on cost, but also on reliability. Every soldering point is a point of failure source. Um, and we do this with uh, having a good SOC, uh, using the PSOC and good system partitioning. And then the value add that we bring to the table is the way that we partition the system and we package this and power and cool this. And the connector definition. Um, so the thing that we're being Finishing right now, you see a rendering uh, is a 2 year rack unit with two BB2s. Uh, the rendering is not fully complete yet, so you don't see the connection of the water here at the end. Uh, here's our networking interfaces, uh, power supplies, but this is what we intend to bring to market uh, later uh, this year. Um, IBM is not going to bring this to market. We were very fortunate that we found, well, he found us to be honest. Um, there was a Dutch investor who came across us at CBIT a year ago and said, I'm looking for a new challenge and I think you are it. 
So the website is now up. Uh, as customer for any new startup, it is devoid for, of any real information, but you can look at it. Uh, the market introduction through Isla Microservices is planned in the summer of this year. Um, so what I would like to do is to uh, finish uh, the ARM server board, obviously, uh, finish the FPGA board, uh, looking for funding to build GPU and a Xeon D board, bring this to market uh, later this year. And Isla Market Servers is in April uh, open to order get orders for evaluation systems. And I'm also looking for uh, partners to work with me in an H2020 proposal to go in the next step of packaging. So I'm convinced that with existing silicon today, uh, by doing advanced packaging, I can increase the density still by a factor of four. And I need some money to do that. Now the application area is of course clearly Industry 4.0. Uh, because now we can move a rack unit to uh, a factory floor without using a lot of space. It fits in moving the compute to the edge of IoT. Um, and you can Im imagine that having the very compact water-cooled uh, technology fits on mobile applications. So think drones, think uh, self-driving cars. So what are the trends? Well, making things small really works to improve energy efficiency. I think we have the proof behind me to show that. Using SOC you remove many chip crossings and you save energy in that. Um, we save power in ex unexpected places. I explained how we solve power in the Phi, but also soldering down the DRAM chips directly next to the SOC solves po saves power. What turns out is that all the DDR controllers are programmable and one of the things you can program is the matching impedance. Since our distances are so short, we can relax the impedance matching resistor values and we spend a lot less power in I.O. So the power that we use in our DRAM subsystems is half from what we had expected. So putting the, the, the DRAM chips close to the SOC without going through dim connectors and longer traces on the circuit boards, we save power. Uh, we only saw that when we started to measure uh, our system. By the way, our BB2 is fully instrumented with power, so amp measuring capability on all the power domains. So we can live show you, without additional um, equipment, we can live show you all of the currents while we run applications of the CPU, of the DRAM, of the I.O., the whole shebang. Water cooling is a necessary ingredient. Um, it's not such that I'm a particular proponent of water cooling or air cooling, but water cooling is just necessary to get this density. And so it actually uh, is, to me, absolutely clear that the future of, of systems is going to go water cooling. Hot water cooling has the advantage that you can, if you get the temperatures right, resell the hot water as a commodity. So you can gain up to 80% of the energy cost that you use to run your computing back by selling this. Now in certain geographies it doesn't work, but even in places like Abu Dhabi you then get free cooling because you can run this through a, a hot plate at the outside of your building. With sprinklers you run cold water on the outside, it evaporates and you get free cooling. This is much less expensive than running a chiller. Hot water has the other advantage that you don't have cold pipes in your data center where you have condensation issues. Um, so hot water cooling is to be absolutely uh, the way that we need to start thinking about building high density data centers. And I think the future scaling roadmap is in fact much more in ultra dense packaging rather than spending billions in fabs that go with very difficult lithography with extreme UV etc. That's basically it. I have a couple of links, literature. We publish our work so you can go to, uh, I think this is a paper which I'm quite proud of, where we show the T4240 that was published two years ago at ISS SCC. 
Um, we don't do this on our own, so the team in Zurich is small, but we are able to leverage uh, loads of people uh, working with us, uh, with NXP, with other parts of IBM, uh, with Astron. So here you see a list of names which are uh, people that really worked on this a lot, but there's many, many people behind the scenes that, uh, that are not on this list. And I definitely acknowledge the, the Dutch government in giving us the grant for this work. Without them, this would not have been possible. I like to do lightweight things. I like to do energy efficient things. So this picture is another uh, proof of this. Okay, folks, that's it for the Rich Report. Stay tuned for more news and information on high-performance computing.